we're live. All right, so this is Mark Tyndall. He's in Oklahoma. Um, he said right in the center of the state. And he is a phenomenal Mount Dulcimer player. Um, plays four equidistant strings most of the time, I guess. And then I found out recently that he builds. And he definitely, I was intrigued. I believe that one in the back behind you on the on my left, that is Hannah's. Is that right? Yep. Okay. And, and that one, more when I saw that, I was like blown away. And I'm sure he'll show that to you and all. But it, 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 I saw it and I was like, oh, I want that. <laughs> and it's one of those you'll pry it from her cold, dead fingers, I think. So. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> all right. So go ahead, Mark. I'm going to give it to you. And then right. uh, whatever you want to do. Well, Brett, thank you, first of all, for hosting this and, and doing this. I'm having fun. This is kind of a new venture for me. I've never done a Zoom meeting quite like this. I've been in a few, but that's been about the extent of it. I've uh, never uh, been the talking head here, so hopefully I won't put everybody to sleep. But I thought I'd start with a real quick little background of who I am, what I've done, where I've been. Uh, I'm 62 years old, so I've got a little bit of history going on here. Uh, but basically back in the 80s and 90s, sounds funny to say that, uh, I was playing, teaching, performing, recording, and building uh, mountain dulcimers. Um, and that was what I referred to, my wife and I both referred to it as BC, before children. Uh, so before we started a family, uh, we did start a family and it was like, you know, this is really kind of a tough way to make a living for uh, a budding family here. So I got a, a real job and uh, had a career in the AV uh, audiovisual industry for about uh, 16 or so of the 25 year hiatus here and uh, enjoyed it and made a decent living, but I always missed the woodworking and missed the playing and missed the building dulcimers. So I was finally able to kind of ease back into that a little bit. And that started with the uh, guitar stands and banjo stands and mandolin stands and all those that I build under the name of Solid Ground Stands, which is what this is. And I've got one back here I could show a little bit later. Um, and that kind of got me off the ground back into woodworking and afforded me the opportunity to leave the corporate world and the day job and get back into this full time. All the while in the back of my head, I'm going, I can't wait till I'm building dulcimers again. Um, not that I don't enjoy building the stands I do. It's like building a, a fine piece of furniture um, as opposed to just, you know, cranking out a cabinet or something quick. Um, and I really enjoy it. It's working with some beautiful hardwoods. Uh, I never can take credit for the beauty of the woods. That's something the creator makes, not me. <laughs> uh, but just utilizing the woods and um, in various ways, the uh, stands have been good, uh, but not quite enough to make me uh, comfortable financially. So the dulcimers have been supplementing that, but here over the last six months to a year or so, it's kind of been reversing where the dulcimers are kind of taking the forefront and the stands are kind of dropping back a little bit, and which is perfectly fine with me. So uh, I'm, I'm getting my feet under me, building again. I built about 120 instruments back in the day, and uh, so far now I've done a couple dozen uh, back on this this go round. Uh, so it's very exciting and fun for me. I'm getting I, all during that time. I, I would have uh, a lot of education going on in my mind. I watched a lot of YouTube videos about guitar building, amongst other things. Uh, learning what I could from that. Uh, to apply to building dulcimers and uh, that has helped a lot now with this go around so my designs have kind of been percolating around in my head for 25 years and I'm finally getting back to actually making sawdust and making something and, and that's exciting so um, what I thought I'd do is kind of show you a little bit about the work I do uh, I have a variety of tools in my shop I have hand tools, I have uh, lots of jigs and fixtures like you see behind here. I'll kind of talk about a few of those that are of interest. I also have a uh, CNC and a laser, um, and I use those a little bit on the dulcimers. I use them quite a lot on the stands uh, to help me uh, fabricate the parts and so forth. But on the dulcimers, uh, 
I, I asked myself if it was going to uh, maximize or increase my accuracy and repeatability, then I consider, can I do that on the CNC? And all the CNC is, it stands for com computer numeric control. It's a router, so it's a very fast spinning cutter spinner that can move around and in, right where you tell it to, to do certain things. But all I use it for on the dulcimers primarily is the uh, fret slotting, which has to be dead on every single time or your instrument plays out of tune. Uh, so I use it for that. I use it for uh, like leveling, perfectly flat leveling the sides and blocks and everything before I glue a back on. That's another step I do on the CNC. You can do it by hand, you can do it with, with hand tools and sanders and scrapers and things, but to get that repeatability and accuracy, it takes a, a long, long, long time to get really good at that, to get make those seams perfect. The CNC just does it perfect every time for me. Uh, but I'll tell you what, before I go too much further, since I'm talking about the CNC, my two favorite tools in this shop are these right here. So that's my favorite chisel. I use that a lot when I'm carving braces, as well as this little hand plane. These two guys, I just, there's a lot of satisfaction in using the hand tools. Uh, and there's honestly no better way to do that task than with these guys. You, you can't do it better with, a, with any other type of tool. So I use these quite a bit. But uh, let me start here. Uh, this little jig, uh, this, this technology has been around for hundreds of years. Uh, when you start with a dulcimer, you start with a block of wood that you've, you've uh, dimensioned and you go through a bandsaw to resaw it like this so that you wind up with what's called foot matched grain. And the grain is, is maybe hard to see in the video there, but it's one pattern here and it's flipped in the same pattern over here so you get that nice mirror image. Uh, these then get, which these are just right off the bandsaw, so they're rough right now, but they, uh, they get sanded to a certain thickness, take care of all the, the bandsaw marks, and they ultimately have to be glued together here on the edge to create a, uh, a plate that becomes a top or a back. This would be a, this one happens to be a, uh, the back, uh, the other one's a top and you'll get the sound holes cut out of it and so on. But anyway, this is what I came across this, again, from the uh, guitar builder guys. <laughs> uh, this is wonderful. It's a real easy jig. You have to uh, obviously get them thickness properly and get your edge jointed here so that the two between there, you don't see any daylight between them, so it's a nice, good joint. Put your glue on there, lay them down here, and then it's a rope and wedges system. And it's real fast and real easy. So let's say I did all that other pre-work I come in here and I wrap this rope on here like this. It goes around and around and around. Just like so. Oops, what too many. Twice on each one. And then it gets kind of tied off here on the bottom. And then these wedges will go in here in each of these ropes just like that, and what happens is you get pressure downward so the two plates aren't doing this anywhere, so they're, they're mated properly, but you're also getting pressure this way to close that glue joint, and they just get tapped in there and so on, and when it's all dry, you just pull the wedges out, take the rope off, and then you have a plate, and then that plate will go back through a thickness sander to get down to the final thickness. But they were honest. I think it's one of those cool old things that, you know, how can you do that any better? <laughs> and it's been around a long time. I'm going to set this aside over here. Another one is the, uh, what's called the Go Bar Deck. This is a fun one. Yeah, it's a little heavy, but that's all right. What this guy is, again, this has been around for centuries, the technology of it. But basically, uh, I use it primarily for gluing on braces. So I, if this were a, a, a back plate, let's say, it's actually a template, but if it were a back plate, I'd sit it in here and I'd put glue on my brace and locate it where I need to locate it. 
Then I use these are actually fiberglass rods. Back in the day, that would all have been uh, wood rods. But the, you get clamping pressure by the distance between here and the top plate. And all you do is you put this on here. And my hands are shaking a little bit. I guess I'm nervous. Huh. So anyway, just put it on there like that, and you find the spot on the top, and it puts all that clamping pressure down on these braces. But the beauty of this is, rather than having a whole bunch of clamps around the edge, the beauty is you can come back with, uh, I've got a, a lesser favorite chisel that I use for this, but I can, I can clean out all the glue squeeze up on either side of the brace right here while the glue's still wet, so there's no glue showing inside the instrument. Uh, but it's a beautiful way to do that. I actually even glue my top uh, onto the, or the back on first and then the top on, so all the way around the instrument. That's called a go-bar deck, and these are called go-bar go -bar rods. <laughs> There's a bunch of them up there. That's a fun one. This guy here is my uh, side bending jig, so it's what I use to, uh, yeah, here over here. You start off with a, a flat piece of wood, you end up with something like this to be able to build the instrument with that has the curves on it. And it's basically just a uh, silken uh, heating blanket in between two pieces of spring steel for support. And you basically make this sandwich with these guys wrapped, uh, you spritz them with water and you wrap them with aluminum foil to keep the moisture in. And you make this sandwich, place it on here, and you first do the, the waste here as it heats up. And then you roll these things down the end to get the, the latter part of the, of the curve this way. Uh, really nice uh, jig to use. Uh, the, the, the idea of this has been around for a long time, but this is a more recent uh, addition, which is a, a temperature controller. So you don't have to guess at it or waste some sides while you're trying to figure it out. Uh, you can actually dial in the exact temperature that the blanket is and then dial it down a little bit after you've bent so the, the, uh, the less hot, less amount of heat can kind of set the bend uh, before you uh, totally turn it off and take it out. And it takes about, with all the time you got to wait, uh, about 30 minutes or so, and you've got a set of sides bent. And then the next thing they go into is this. You've probably seen something like this before if you've ever seen a, a, a luthier shop. It's just a luthier's mold. It's the shape, the exact shape of the outside of my instrument with a uh, mating uh, inside piece that expands by these uh, little knobs here. But you basically cut your side to length and you get it set in here and you expand out these clamps in the center and this holds the, the final exact shape while you glue up the box basically. These are the little blocks of wood that go in the end. They get shaped down exactly so they, they fit in there right now. They're oversized uh, before I do that and they get clamped on there to clamp into the sides and then we have a piece inside each corner of the instrument called lining. It's just a piece of spruce that's also been bent on the side bender and those get glued and clamped with these little uh, clothesman type clamps, spring clamps, all the way around inside there to cut the length and fit in there. And then all that, uh, sides, linings and blocks has to be flattened before you can glue the back on or the top if you're on the other side. So that's one of those steps I do on the CNC. I take this whole thing and set it up and bolt it down to a couple of very precisely located spots on the CNC and it'll come along with a router and flatten that for me uh, for in about, uh, I think it probably takes less than a minute for it to actually go, well maybe it's about two minutes to go around the edge and I've got a perfectly flat uh, level uh, plane to work with to be able to glue on a back plate to that. So, and then once you do that, then this, this can come apart, the two halves can come apart so you get the piece out of the inside. And then you flip it over and do the same thing on the other side. Always got to remember though to take the inside out. <laughs> Don't ever let that happen to you. <laughs> uh, glue that inside and have a real heavy dulcimer. So there's that, and then this is what my next 
this is a neck in progress. Get up here where you can see it. So uh, it's a solid piece of wood here. This piece is, is uh, added on for the heel block and it's mortised into the block that goes into the body of the instrument. So there's a good strong joint there. Um, this is another step I do on the CNC. So I have a jig that will hold this at that angle like this and the CNC can make this perfectly flat surface for me to glue the headstock on. Uh, yeah, I've got one back here. So that, that gets glued onto there, so that joint is perfect every time. And then it gets shaped, you know, to be flush and everything. And when the neck is complete, this is glued on, and I've got a tailpiece glued on down here. Then I can also use the CNC to uh, flatten that once again to glue the rosewood fingerboard on and then flatten the rosewood fingerboard perfectly again so it's perfectly flat every time and come back in and do the fret slotting uh, with that really small tiny bit it's like 23 thousandths of an inch bit to do fret slots uh, it'll also do the most of the carving of the uh, tail piece that I put on the dulcimers that way too so I actually use the CNC probably more on the neck than I do on the body there's just a few steps here there's several more steps here but it just helps me to concentrate a lot on other things rather than some of the mundane parts of it that just need to be accurate every time. And then that whole neck channel, if you can see that, that's where you can see it, there's actually a lot of it hollowed out here underneath, like a boat underneath the fingerboard. This is shallower here because that's where the, the uh, picking scallop is there where you strum. But a lot of the mass is taken out. Uh, but another thing I'm doing on my dulcimers that I thought about, again, from the guitar building community, <laughs> was one of the things, over time, some dulcimers, not all, it, it depends on the piece of wood and your uh, uh, environment, the temperature, humidity it's kept in, things like that. It's not uncommon to have a uh, fingerboard or a neck that starts developing a bow in it one way or the other, over time, over years not something that you'll see right away. And to prevent that, to keep the necks as flat as possible for as long as possible, I am also incorporating two, uh, and I don't have any here, actually I'm out right at the moment, little uh, carbon fiber rods that are put into a groove in the top of this right here, underneath the rosewood uh, fingerboard that would, that would actually go on top of that. So you never see it, you never know it's there, unless I tell you, <laughs> uh, but it helps strengthen the neck and keep it stiffer. The other uh, advantage that it gives too is anytime you can add stiffness to the instrument, you're going to gain sustain. And anytime that you uh, make it looser in any way, you, you lose sustain but you gain volume. So you're always trying to find the balance between the sound you want to hear um, and, you know, I, can, I could build a louder dulcimer than I do, but I don't care as much for the sound, for this, the, I like the sustain. I like to hear those notes ring on and not be real choppy. I like when you get up above the seventh fret, for instance, uh, I, I want to hear those notes ring. I want to just, you know, nice and clear tones. That's just my preference. Uh, if you play a lot of, you know, traditional fiddle tune type style, uh, especially with a group or an ensemble, and you need more punch or volume, I can kind of build my dulcimer a little bit towards that by using a spruce top, for instance, on an instrument. It will gain a little bit more volume, but it loses a little bit of sustain. So those two, uh, luthiers, guitar luthiers, uh, mandolins, uh, others, you know, we're all trying to, you want to increase the volume so that you can play, you know, quietly and tenderly and softly, but still have a lot of instrument there but you can also get loud when you need to get loud. So it's a, it's a constant, uh, uh, almost trial and error experimentation. That's the kind of stuff that I want to uh, focus on in my building uh, to be able to try to maximize that. And I'm making a lot of steps in that direction. I'm, I'm loving how some of these are turning out. Others are like, okay, that's still good, but it's not my favorite. But if somebody plays this particular style of music, that might be a better fit for them. So I can still build uh, a, a range of sounds within the confines or the bookends, if you will, of my particular design.
and that's going to be different than another's design and another's design. You know, the, that's the beauty of, you know, if, if you're looking for a certain type of sound, sometimes it's just picking the right uh, builder because that's the way their their particular design would work. So anyway, that's that's that. Uh, I guess before I move on to the instruments itself, but are there anybody that has questions at this point? Yeah. Brent, you got any yet? Are you muted still? Any questions yet? Uh, no. G uh, Jamie just said, I've wa always wondered if there was a reason for book matched backs that need to be glued rather than starting with the solid base of wood. Is that just appearance? That's a good question. Um, the way I would answer that is that first of all, if you're, it takes a what's called a bandsaw to resaw the wood into those thin pieces that get made up to a back. If you, uh, it, then the bandsaw is a big band of saw blade that's running around two wheels, one with a motor on it, and so you're seeing this saw blade constantly going down into the table, and you're pushing it against that saw to do these these resaw cuts as they're called. So the difference is if you resaw, this happens to be a piece of red cedar, uh, that's the width, that's like a little over four inches wide. So it's standing up vertically on this, like this on the bandsaw and the blade is cutting this way. You know, as you're passing it like my finger was the blade or here. Uh, pretend like this was the blade. So there's my, my blade and I'm bringing it to the blade like this. I'm only resawing through that height, that four inches. If you go with a one piece back, let's say this was originally all one piece. I mean, this was two and resawed, but let's say it was uh, one. You're now resawing through eight inches of material. So A, it takes a much beefier bandsaw. Uh, that's about the width of half of a guitar plate. So it's not uncommon, but it takes a bigger bandsaw, first of all, and very accuracy, very much accurate. Needs to be very accurate in order to keep that blade from doing any of this in the middle of the cut, because it's just a band of steel, um, so that you don't waste a lot of material and wind up with part of that plate is too thin to use or uh, blows out the backside or something like that. So just from working it, it's a lot easier to work it that way. Um, as far as sound goes, I don't think it makes any difference one way or the other for sound. Now, aesthetics, the way it looks, uh, a one-piece back looks good. Um, I personally prefer just the symmetry of having a book-matched back and top and sides, even for that matter. Um, you know, that's a, that's a matter of preference. Anything aesthetic is a matter of a pre preference. You know, beauty in the eye is a beholder and all that. But, there's nothing structurally or acoustically really any different one to the other. So it's mostly a matter of how hard it is to work the wood and what your final appearance is. All right, Jana <clears throat> asked, are all of your dulcimers hourglass shape? Is that a preference for a particular reason? Good question. Um, at this point, the answer is yes. Uh, short answer is yes. Uh, that's all I've built. I've always preferred the hourglass shape over a, a teardrop, primarily for two reasons. One is I think you've got, generally in most everybody's designs, you've got more soundboard area to, to work with, more uh, square inches of soundboard uh, in that versus the narrower upper end of the dulcimer. So that, that can help with your, with your uh, sound of your issue, your volume and so forth. But secondly too, playing one, uh, if you're up on a stand, it may not matter as much, but sitting down on your lap, I've always, I never got comfortable with a teardrop uh, with my left hand. It was always tipping and it didn't ever feel comfortable. And that may just be me. Uh, so as, they're both valid designs. Uh, even the ones I've seen that are more, not even really a teardrop, they're just more of a big wide, you get a lot of soundboard with that, but they might get kind of wide in the center for playing comfortably on your lap. That's a matter of preference. Uh, I think there's a lot more 
other things that affect the sound far greater than which body shape it is. I mean, that does affect it, but how it's braced, how thick the materials, the top and back are, things of that nature, uh, the size of the sound box, the volume of the box, you know, uh, area volume, uh, how much water could you put in it if you poured water in it, that sort of thing. Um, that'll affect the sound uh, timber, the, the, uh, the voice of the instrument, there we go, more than just as a teardrop or, or hourglass. Uh, Jamie asked, there are all sorts of opinions on what woods make the best tones. What is your preference if you are making a dulcimer for personal use? For me personally, in my designs, what I have heard that I like the best so far is koa on the back and sides and a western red cedar top. That piece, this, this is western red cedar and uh, it's very uh, tight, uh, straight grain that's that's perfectly quarter sawn so the grain is running vertical through the edge of it here uh, makes a very good soundboard it has um, just a little bit more volume than if i was to use koa on the top of that same dulcimer but it also has a nice sweet sustaining that quality that i was describing earlier that i like particularly up in the higher notes and so i really like the uh the tone of the cedar um, but another one that I'm excited about that I'm going to be building one here in my next set of builds is uh, the uh, Sapele, which is kind of like mahogany. It's not a true mahogany, but that's, it's, it, you think of it as mahogany. Guitar builders use it a lot in uh, necks and backs and sides now because genuine mahogany is getting harder and harder to get. Um, this piece I've been showing you here I'll do this because I've got to show you this. Uh, let me move this out of the way. The sapele tends to be a little stiffer, so I'm still kind of dialing in exactly, you know, like how thick the tops and backs are, because that affects the sound a lot, because it, it affects how stiff the plates are. And I am uh, encouraged by the sound that I'm hearing, but I'm still kind of dialing in. You have to build one completely and then make an evaluation and then build another one, do a couple of things a little bit differently perhaps, and build another one and then just compare them, that sort of thing. And I'm pretty pleased with the sound I'm getting, but uh, I have not yet built one with a softer wood on the top like cedar, but I don't think cedar would look good with this mahogany. So another, uh, cedar by the way is often used on classical guitars for the tops there um, because it has that nice rich tone up high uh, and some good volume. Another popular choice is redwood and I have yet to build one out of redwood but I have some coming and I'm going to be building one of these dulcimers with a redwood top and I'm excited about what I think it's going to sound like. Everything I've been researching on and doing that, I just haven't actually gone through those motions yet, but that'll be happening here over the next several weeks. Um, and uh, the sapele, even just the plain sapele, like, uh, well, I don't have one out here, but uh, without any fanciness to the grain, it's just a kind of a ribbon striped looking uh, mahogany. Sounds really good to me. It's still a little bit, uh, what's the word? Uh, it's like it's still, there's still a little more sound inside that instrument that's not quite getting out yet. And that's going to be me tweaking my bracing and the patterns and sizes of the bracing and doing some experimenting there, which I'm going to be doing more of. Uh, it sounds good, but I know I can get it better. And that's where I'm headed with that. So I have, uh, was fortunate enough to get a very fancy board of sapele that has a lot of quilted figure to it. And I'm going to pair this with that redwood top. I have somebody who's already uh, having me build them one that way. And uh, he got all on board with it just like I did. So <laughs> it's like, let's do this. And uh, it's going to be fantastic. I'm going to get off camera here for just a second. I got to turn a light on here because you got to see what this wood looks like. And it takes light in the right direction. But uh, if you've ever seen any really highly figured woods, see if I can get that right. 
Can you see how that plays off the light? I'm trying to get the reflection out of there. There we go. It just, it looks like a quilt or, uh, you know, it looks 3D. It's just amazing stuff. And that's not even really sanded. That's got a little bit of shellac on it right now. So you can see a little bit of the color, but amazing stuff. So it's going to be beautiful for sure. There's no doubt there. And then pairing that with a redwood top, what I'm totally expecting to gain with the redwood top is, again, more sustain and more of that richer, uh, upper register sound without losing you know all the bass you know you want to retain that as well uh, but redwood is commonly used on classical guitars as well i have a uh, uh alvarez yari guitar from japan that i've had since uh, i graduated from high school so that was many years ago and that guitar has been around with me everywhere i've been it has genuine mahogany that looks like this stuff does um, but the top is redwood, and I've always liked how that guitar sounds up in the higher registers. It's just, they're, they're so clear, and they just sing up there. Um, it just has so much sparkle to it. So anyway, that's a long-winded answer, but that's, uh, redwood is a good choice. I can't remember what the original question was now. <laughs> I've gone way off the deep end here. <laughs> no, just, just what woods you, would you use? Sure. What do you recommend? So other than that, uh, Basically, walnut sounds great. Walnut's a little brighter. I like the sound of cherry. Uh, there's a lot of people out there that prefer cherry over walnut for sound, and I would tend to agree with that. Uh, walnut is, is good, but it kind of loses a little bit of the warmth down low every time I've, I've done walnut instruments. Uh, not to really make it a negative, it's not really negative, it's just I think the cherry excels more top to bottom. Um, I don't do a lot with spruce on the top, uh, but I did one recently where I used uh, rosewood, uh, Morado, which is called Bolivian rosewood, although it's not a true rosewood uh, in the, what, the uh, scientific classification sense, but it's, it's very much like rosewood. It's what I use as my fingerboards. It's, it's a very hard, dense, uh, durable wood, but a very pretty back and side on that rosewood with a spruce top and it actually sounds I, I, the sound has really grown on me a lot i like it a lot still not my favorite i still like the koa with the cedar so far but uh you know spruce top will generally always give you a little more volume but it comes at a little bit of a price in that the volume is a, a quicker punch in sound that decays quicker generally speaking that's the nature of the spruce uh, it's going to make it a little louder but uh, the sustain will be a little less. So kind of the balance, you know, if you're really into fiddle tunes, fast, lots of notes, uh, uh, almost a bluegrass kind of approach to dulcimer, then a spruce top's gonna suit that well, very well. Um, whereas a hardwood top like walnut or cherry or the sapele mahogany, those kind of woods will tend to not have quite as much punch out there, but a lot sweeter sound. <clears throat> Were you going to cover, uh, I'm going to ask this in a second, Jamie, uh, the engraving? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I have, uh, hang on a second. Yeah, I have talking my throat. Right? Kind of get me started, but I sometimes can't stop. I love working with this stuff, and I love talking about it. Um, I mentioned what I do with the CNC. I also have a laser engraver. And I use that on dulcimers. Primarily, I can cut my sound holes with it. Uh, back in the day when I was doing it, it was drawing your pattern on the top and drilling a hole through it and threading a jeweler saw, a little coping saw through there. And you know, doing this around all those corners and all that, and then coming back with files and sandpaper. And it, it very, very, very time consuming. And the results were never as good as I would have liked to them to be. With the laser, I can draw the sound hole shape on the computer and I have a, a, a fixture in my laser. I can put my top in there and it will come in and, and in about 30 seconds cut those sound holes out for me. So those maple leaf sound holes, for instance, you see, well, <laughs> that you don't see there, I have to see on this one. You know, these are cut with laser. 
uh, just very quickly. So I could do any shape. Uh, I kind of settled in on the Rocky Mountain maple leaves just because I was in Estes Park, Colorado for a number of years and liked that shape. Wanted to do something a little different than the traditional heart shape or, or just circles and came up with that and it's kind of stuck with me since. So I used the laser for doing the sound holes, but I also use it for doing what are called pockets in the wood to do inlay. So I can, again, anything I can get in the computer, a, a scan or a, draw it up from scratch, um, I can create very fine pointed vectors in there. If you ever think about the normal or the, the uh, way that's been done for years for inlay is you use a very small little router to go around your shape and create that pocket for the piece to sit in or whatever you're inlaying into the wood. But that's always a round bit. So we can never get to a sharp, crisp corner. Well, the laser can because it's a very fine light, basically, that's, that's uh, creating that pocket, uh, burning it. It's actually vaporizing the wood is what a laser does, uh, but to a certain depth. And I can get very crisp and clean uh, detail. And so on my essential model here that has, uh, that I'm offering under $1,000 now, uh, I'm, I'm doing just an engraving on the headstock. So you can get a close up of that. You see there, you can see it's just a pocket that's cut in the wood and left. And that's what, when you see laser engraved things out there, that's what they mostly are. The etching is just, it's how far into the wood are you going with that? But I can also take that same pocket after the laser has created that for me. I was going to do this more at the end, but I'll show you this one. And fill it. And if you can see the, the Tyndall logo up there, I'm trying to get the, where the reflection isn't on there. there. Uh, that is actually filled with very fine metal powders of various colors. This one happens to be uh, bronze on this one here. But I, I typically use uh, pewter on most of my mid-level dulcimers for that. It's really nice, crisp, but you see how sharp those lines are? If I can get it in there. Real, lots of detail to that. Um, Wait, before you put that up, could you show them the... Uh down the, the uh, fretboard oh, yeah. the inlay yeah my daughter hannah who's in the other room there she is an artist and and uh she designed the artwork and i worked with her on the engineering side of it to try to make it where we could do this but uh, the other thing i'm able to do now on my cnc is actually cut very small uh pearl mother of pearl and abalone pieces to do that inlay work again that was also when you do it by hand extremely time consuming and detailed and and what are the results when you're done how how you know it takes years and years and years and years of doing that to get really good at it so i can now cut these pieces out these very fine little pieces on the cnc the only danger is you got to be careful that your dust collection doesn't just suck them right up and you lose them at the start over <laughs> but uh anyway so i used the laser to create the pocket in the wood and then use the CNC with a very small bit, that same one I used for the fret slotting, to do all the fine inlay work on the neck there. Let's see how that works there. So the lighter color is pearl. The center of the two roses there is more of that metal powder. In this case, it happens to be brass. Um, and the sound hole, that one's got an inlay in it, so that's rosewood uh, giving you the little veining look to it. And the center is brass. And this one up here on the headstock is pearl and abalone leaves, and the stem is brass or uh, bronze. But it allows me to do the, the really fancy inlays. This is as fancy a dulcimer as I've ever done. It's also got a uh, three layer binding on it, so the, let's see if I can get a shot of that. So you've got the actual binding on the corner is sapele, and then there's a curly maple piece on either side, and then the top also has a black, white, black strip uh, violin perfling on it. So I can get, uh, you know, somebody wants a really fancy dulcimer, I can certainly do that. And uh, 
I'm glad that she decided she wanted to do this because I go, hey, I can keep this one around and keep showing it around. But <laughs> normally I, I build them and they go and I never see them again. <laughs> yeah, it's a beautiful instrument. Thank you. It was a lot of fun to do and, uh, you know, probably three, close to three, yeah, I'd say three times the hours, uh, man hours in that dulcimer than just a standard one because of the inlays and the, that, that binding is a several step process to do those uh, various bindings like that. Again, from guitar builders, a lot of the really nice guitars that are being made out these days, uh, lots of builders that are building just works of art on guitars. I'm thinking, uh, I think dulcimers deserve instruments like that too. <laughs> I, I like building the basic ones, don't get me wrong, you know, the ones that have not all the frills, because to me it's mostly about the music, but it's also about the art, the art of the woodworking and the, the creativity. I love doing all that. Um, I get as much fun out of trying to figure out how to get the CNC to do what I want it to as I do playing music, but if I had, at the end of the day, I have to say, yeah, it, it ultimately comes down to the music. That's what gives me the greatest satisfaction. So on that note, no pun intended, uh, maybe I'll give you a little demo of, of these instruments I've got out here. Um, I did want to ask this, or Jamie wrote this, and I'm going to read it backwards simply because it's going to be easier that way. She wrote, so neat what you can achieve with custom sound holes and accents. Uh, I've been drooling over a Glowforge laser cutter engraver. I'm not, I'm sure you have a more commercial model, but they sure are fun. So I don't know if that was a comment or if, were you wanting to? A... I have a, a Boss laser is the one that I have made by Boss. Probably heard of that brand. <clears throat> and the thing that got me to it, it's a box about, you know, this big and it sits right over here. Uh, i show it to you, but it's, uh, the, the laser bed of it is only 16 by 20, so kind of on the smaller side, but I can get my, like a dulcimer top is 30 inches long, you know, I can get that in there because it has pass through doors on all four sides, so I can get bigger pieces in there than where I'm actually lasering. Uh, like my uh, guitar stand legs, I was going to grab one here, but I don't think any of those have the engraving on them yet. Uh, the back leg has my logo on there. Well, the leg won't fit in the laser that way. They kind of stick out the end, but I've got a little fixture that sits in there that I just plop them in there on that fixture right where they go on little uh, pins that go through the bolt holes. And uh, that locates it for me and I can run five at a time through the laser. So the laser is smaller footprint lasering, but the pass-throughs allow me to get bigger parts in it. Um, I've heard of the Glowforge ones a lot, but I've not, I did all the research back 2018, so it's been five years since I've had these. I've not thought about that since, so I'm sure there's a lot of new machines out there and different ones that I know nothing about, because uh, I haven't, had, you know, I obviously can't keep up with all that. My lasers, I mean, my uh, CNC is actually pretty small too. It's only got a two foot by three foot bed, but it's big enough for me to get any part I need up on there. And when I do my stands, for instance, I've, I've got it divided into three sections across so I can get three sets of parts and push go on one of those and it'll do whatever it's gonna do to three parts of, uh, before I have to stop and reload it and come back. But all that CNC does for me is it helps with parts and joinery, but there, I still have, you know, two bandsaws sitting over there and a planer and a joiner and a chop saw and tons of scrap wood that I need to uh, take care of here. And lots of sanding and finishing and waxing. I wax the, I do an oil and wax finish on the stands. I do a uh, environmentally friendly uh, finish on the dulcimers. It's a water-based lacquer, so there's no VOCs going into the atmosphere. And, it's safer for the environment, it's safer for my health, um, and it's a, a, a fairly decent finish. I, I like it a lot. Uh, it's not quite the wow finish of a nitro cellulose lacquer is on vintage guitars, but that stuff is dangerous and volatile and, and bad for your health. <laughs> all, all that stuff is like, nope, not going to go there. 
So I stick with this water-based lacquer and it does really well for me. She also said, do you also install internal pickups, single or double preference? Some builders build their own, I think maybe more common in guitar luthiers. I, I use, um, I have LR Bags brand making me my dulcimer pickups. And that sounds like, wow, I'm having them make them. Well, what happens is it's just to get to my string spacing. So it's really the same dulcimer pickup as like the one you can get from Blue Lion or other places where they're selling. It's a bridge saddle. It basically replaces the bridge here. This is bone that I use. I use a bone nut saddle. But with the uh, pickup, it's got uh, uh, micarta as the top that you would put your grooves in for your strings. And then right underneath it all the way across is a little brass piece there. In there are the pickup sensors. And uh, I can install those on my dulcimers. I can even do it after the fact now. Figured out how to do that. Uh, so later down the road, if somebody wanted to have a pickup installed on one of my dulcimers, I can do that. Uh, and it winds up with an end pin jack here for the cable to plug in. Uh, and there's a little bit of wire that goes from that up to the, to the uh, pickup. But I got to tell you, uh, I had some done like that way back in the day, and I did maybe half a dozen of them back in the 80s and 90s, and never really liked the sound. It was only a convenience thing if you felt like you needed to plug in the PA system versus using a microphone, which was always prone to feedback because of those wedge monitors sitting right down there where your microphone's pointed to it almost, you know. So back in the day, a pickup was convenient but it never sounded good to me. It always sounded like you hear this buzzy, yucky kind of mm. electronic sound. Yeah, the notes are there and you can get big and loud, but the quality of the sound wasn't there. When I got the first one of these installed, installed this time, so 25 years later, um, whatever they've done to improve it, which I know they have over the years, I plugged that thing in and turned it on. I'm going, wow, this sounds natural. It's still not going to sound as good as a good quality microphone. You know, I think that's almost impossible from a pickup because it's a different physical dynamic that's happening there. A microphone out here versus a pickup right here. The strings are putting tension on. But that said, I was really pleased with it. And I play through it uh, through a little floor amp, actually. Um, and I do that in my church uh, where we're doing in-ear monitors. Uh, played a few times there now with these pickups on the dulcimers. Sound fantastic. I just do a little bit of EQ uh, with just a three-band EQ, if you're familiar with all that. And uh, put a little touch of reverb on it. Mm. And it sounds wonderful. Uh, I'm really pleased with that. I have not played around on mine yet with trying to do anything with a magnetic pickup. Uh, yet, I may still do that, but as of right now, I don't do that. Um, but I can't put the, the Paizo pickup, that's a bridge saddle pickup, right under the bridge and wire it in there. And then it, it first, just so you know, needs to go to a preamp. I don't have any, there's really not enough real estate on a dulcimer to put a lot of electronics unless you take up a whole mess of area or side or whatever. Uh, like uh, McCafferty's doing a lot of that with the with the setup, and, and I love what he's doing. It's kind of cool, but I'm like, man, have you ever seen the back off that thing? Uh, I saw a photo of that recently. It's like there's this mass of electronics inside there for all that. I'm going, you know, that's great for the electronic side, but what about the acoustic side? I can't imagine that not having some effect, but I don't know. But uh, I talked with Stephen Seifert at Winfield a little bit about it, and, and it's like, it's really cool. I like the the doors that can open musically, but that's not going to be everybody's cup of tea. Yeah. You know, some people are going to like it, some people are going to hate it, you know, but that's okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. I don't think there's any other questions, but I'd love to hear you play a little bit. Okay. I can do that. I well, hopefully got that uh, original audio thing figured out on this and it, and it sounds all right. These are just some leather wrapped bumpers I use on my, my counter when I have a booth to keep the dulcimer up so you can hear it because you probably know this, but the back is really active on a mountain dulcimer. 
So anything you can do to lift it up off the surface helps a lot. So this one is a, uh, uh, I have three, well, I have two of the three models that I'm going to do. I'm, I'm going to do a smaller one with a shorter scale length, uh, but that's requiring me to build a lot of new fixtures. So it's going to take some time to get there. Uh, hopefully in the next six months or so, I'll have some of those uh, starting to turn out. Uh, but for now, I have two models. This one is the Serenade, which is a uh, 27-inch VSL. I can do a shorter one, uh, uh, no problem. And uh, that's just a little bit different position of where the bridge goes and then, of course, the, the spacing of the frets. Um, I could do a 26. I could probably even go down to a 25 on this. I don't know what that would sound like yet until I do one. But, um, this 27, I find very comfortable balance. Uh, I don't want to hear this. Let me, let me explain this real quick, though. VSL, vibrating string length, the distance between your the nut and the bridge here. Um, lots of stuff going around about that. A lot of people have a lot of very strong opinions about that. And that's okay. That's, that, that sparks a lot of discussion. Uh, but here's the thing. In my experience, and what I have learned from all of this, is that uh, there's two factors involved. One is the sound, and the other is playability. How hard or easy is it to play? If you go with the really long string length, it's gonna be harder to play chords and things of that nature. If you go with the really short one, sometimes even that's the case. Like if you get on a, a 20, what's the McSpadden ginger? I think like 23 something, less than 24 inches. It's pretty short. When I play, I have one of those at home actually. When I play and I try to get up above the seventh fret, I almost can't do it. And I've got pretty slender fingers. You know, it's just so tight up there. So you can have that playability should come up with long and short bow. But the other is sound. Uh, when you start going with a shorter scaling and we continue to tune to DAD to those pitches, uh, it's almost like you need different string gauges uh, to maximize the sound. In my opinion, you get a lot more richer, fuller sound with a longer string length in general. Now, this is not an absolute. This is kind of a broad brush. It depends on the dulcimer. It depends on a lot of other things. But in general, if you had everything else the same, and the only thing you were changing between this dulcimer and this one was the string length, you're generally going to get a warmer, fuller, in my mind, more complete sound out of a longer string length than you would a shorter. But where's that balance between that and, well, that's great, but that's hard for me to play a, a stretched out A chord like that. And I'm in four equals a string, so one was a one, two, one, four A chord there. You get into these long string lengths, so that's, that's kind of a stretch. And I've got a pretty broad stretch with my hand. But that's real comfortable. Anyway, enough said about that. So the shorter I can do, and uh, I've done a few of those. But to me, you lose a little bit in the sound. So it's a balance of how important one is versus the other to you. Uh, well, I can start with a couple of demos that I do on the videos of each dulcimer I'm putting on the website. I'm trying to do the same two little demos just to give you an idea of what they sound like. It cannot replace the, uh, the experience of being live and hearing it and playing it. There's no contest there but at least you can get an idea of what they sound like. So on each one of those, I have these two demos. Uh, amazing music. strumming as a lot of people like to play but uh, for me anyway it's a little bit more of a strumming piece this one's a little more cross picked uh
that melody, thank you, uh, melody called King's Fold, which most people know it as Star of the County Down, but the melody actually predates Star of the County Down, so it's a very old uh, melody, but I love that one. And uh, while we're on the topic of playing here a little bit, something I was, when I'm sitting at Winfield, uh, in between talking with people, which is, there's some lulls here and there, I'll just sit there and keep playing. I started, uh, again, with that, uh, running it through the pickup because I couldn't hear in the room uh, anyway. It was so loud, just acoustically. There's so much stuff going on, so many people. Uh, so I had to run it through the app, and that touch of reverb is inspiring at times, too. If you've ever played in a reverberant room, it's kind of fun. So I was just noodling around, and I started playing some uh, cross-picked chords. So this is the uh, same melody, Kingsfold but with just kind of a, almost a cross pick pattern. It's an E minor this time instead of B minor. that second D string, that second melody string just kind of ring in the chord. In this case it makes a an E minor seventh chord instead of a true E minor chord. Anyway, fun stuff. Hey. I've written a fair amount of music for the Dulcimer back in the day. I haven't done anything recently, but 90% or more of that came from just sitting down with the instrument and noodling around on different stuff, trying different chords and whatever. So I want to encourage any of you guys out there, just don't forget to do that. <laughs> because that's one of the beauties of this instrument is just, it almost sings itself, you know, if you just put your hands to it and start playing, don't worry about tab numbers or anything like that, and just start playing stuff on it. Uh, it's amazing what sometimes can come out uh, just out of the blue. Hey, uh, Hannah, if she's there, could she put both your websites in the group chat? Can you tell me how to do that? Uh, just type it in. Yeah, just type it in where it says group. It's, it's Tindall. Oh, okay. Okay. It's sgstands.com. Yeah. Just type those in there. Thank just you. Yep. Yeah. And I do, uh, Brett, if i got time, uh, one more item here. This is one of my baritones. So I told you I had the serenade. It's this basic DAD model here uh, without the bindings on it, some other things that allow me to get that price down uh, where I could do it comfortably for just under $1,000. This is the same trim level as that, but the box is another quarter inch deeper than the serenade. I call this one the sonata. And it's a baritone tuned down to A A. So I'm offering that one now too. Uh, in again, serenade, sonata, but these are both trim packages. That's essential, which in my mind is they're all. They're built the same, they sound very similar, you know, depends on the woods, that sort of thing, yes. Uh, but they're, uh, this one is tuned more for a baritone. I've got about, I think it came out to about 12% greater volume in the box here, size of the box, uh, to favor those lower, get the nice rich low end of it, which is the strength of a baritone. Uh, and in the future, I'll have my minuet, which will be the little one generally tuned up to G, but you could also probably do it at D with a little larger string on it, that sort of thing. And that's the essential package. 
chrome tuners, chrome hardware, uh, no inlay, just the engraving here, no rosewood overlay, things like that that, I, that were just aesthetic in nature. And don't affect the sound, the playability, that's all the same. Uh, and then my mid-level has bindings on it, has the rosewood overlay, has an inlay on the headstock, some other things. So uh, that's the premium level. And then I have my custom level would be things like this back here and other things that we've talked about. And, uh, you know, what, what other kind of artwork do you want on the dulcimer? So anyway. Um, okay, so there's two more here. Okay. Uh, Jonna wrote tips on how to treat and not treat a dulcimer. Horror stories. <laughs> <laughs> well, don't don't take it to batting practice. I can tell you that. <laughs> not that I've ever done that. Um, with any musical instrument, uh, stringed instrument, uh, the strings are pulling tension on wood. Basically, is how they all work. They all work the same. Uh, and so one thing you need to understand about wood is even with a finish on it, uh, even with a high gloss guitar finish, you know, like a Taylor guitar or something like that, uh, even with a finish on that, you can never stop the fact that in different uh, humidities, it's going to either give off water or take in water. Now the finishes will slow that process down a lot, and some finishes do that more than others. Uh, but it's a nature, the nature of wood is it's constantly giving off moisture or taking it in unless it's in a static environment all the time. And that can be different inside your case versus inside your home versus outdoors versus you take it with you to a dulcimer festival. Now I don't say all that to scare you. Uh, normally the range of where it's comfortable going to live and be in there is just fine. But when you get to the extremes of, of high temperature that generally higher temperature air will hold more water. So you're going to give off water. It's going to go to the air when it's in a very dry environment, higher temperature environment. If you're in a, a high humidity environment, like I'm here, it's kind of humid here today too, still. It's like, come on fall. <laughs> Um, it's going to take on moisture if it's not already in that environment. So what you want to do is try to minimize the impact of that. So I tell people, even with my stands, the fact that I sell these guitar stands and uh, banjo stands and, and dulcimers and other things, I said, you know, the safest place for your instrument is inside the case. There's no question about that. But the beauty of having a stand, especially a stand that you want to see in your living room with your furniture, <laughs> Uh, that stand, if you have the instrument on the stand, you're likely to play your instrument more often. So finding a balance between is my room, my house, my home uh, fairly temperature controlled? Most, most people's are. We don't really think so much about humidity except in certain parts of the country, one extreme or the other. But humidity, um, that can really damage an instrument over time, uh, high humidity but so can high dryness, both, both of them can. And probably the drier environment, if it's built in an environment that's very humid and goes to an environment that's very dry, the wood's gonna shrink. Um, now that may not cause problems, and it might cause problems. If you go the opposite way, and it's built in an environment that's very dry and controlled, it goes to a very humid, it's gonna take on water and it would swell. And that has different effects on an instrument uh, because of that string tension pulling it this way. When I worked at a cabinet shop, a furniture maker back in New England for a couple of years, I learned about that expansion and contraction of wood. And on a dining table, for instance, uh, they attach their tops to the legs and frame of, that the table goes on. Uh, the screw holes that go up into the top that attach it on there in the center are around, but the ones they use out towards the edge of the wood are ovalized for that reason, because seasonally in a home, a tabletop, you know, four foot wide tabletop, that can change dimensions an eighth of an inch, quarter inch from one season to the other. Now, we don't have that quite that wide a piece of wood that we're working with. We're only talking about eight inches on mine, you know, that, that size, pretty average uh, width. Uh, so it's not quite as much, but extremes can be a problem. 
But other than that, it's just, you know, you can, you can uh, go overboard on handling everything with kit gloves and not doing anything and ever playing music, or you can go to the other extreme and just, you know, be abusive to an instrument. But never leave it in a hot lock car. Uh, <laughs> always, uh, if, you, if you have had that happen, hot or cold, and then you bring it in your house, let it stay in the case for an hour or two before you open up that case. That's, that's a big one, because what you'll do if you, let's say it was in a cold car and you bring it in the house and, you know, yeah, the dulcimer's kind of cold in there. Uh, well, probably the reverse is probably more common, is it's in a hot car out in the sun, and, well, if you had to leave it in there for a couple hours, bring it in the home, leave it in its case or its, its gig bag or whatever you got it in, leave it in there for a couple hours and let it kind of slowly come back down to that right temperature before you open up the bag. Uh, in extreme cases, uh, you could have a very cold instrument come into a house, open up the case, and all of a sudden it feels like the, the instrument has water on it, <laughs> uh, moisture on it. Well, that's because the instrument temperature is below the dew point of what's in the house and it, the water's going to condense on the instrument. So, and I have had that experience before, <laughs> back in the day. It's not fun. It ultimately didn't do any damage, but... Uh, it could have very easily. You said you had another one? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, sorry. I'm not even watching time. I don't know how we're doing on time. No, you're okay. Um, the other thing is, um, I was going to say, I had a student who put her violin in her trunk in the summer. Ooh. And by the time she got to work, it wasn't that, it was like a half hour maybe. And it was completely in pieces. Just in that amount of time, the sides had fallen off yep. and just shattered. I know a couple of people that's happened to. Heat, heat kills. Again. Heat kills uh, wood products, especially when they've got string tension on them like our instruments do. It kills electronics. You know, anything electronic over time, what, what makes them go bad or go wrong or have issues is heat over time. It just, you know, it's detrimental. So. Um, Lisa said, any thoughts for those who prefer finger picking? Those who prefer finger picking? Well, that's a good question. I personally don't play that way much. I demonstrate it, but uh, I've always liked the sound of using a flat pick. But I'm very picky on my flat picks, no pun intended. This is about, happens to be a Jim Dunlop a nylon pick. And the reason I like it better than, uh, I've got one back here, just a smooth plastic, is there's just different sound. Let me uh, pull the other one back up here a second. So what I'm trying to avoid is a real flappy pick sound. I, I don't really care for that myself. Uh, uh, I know the bigger picks are easier to hang on to than the little ones, but this actually has some embossed lettering on it that, that is helpful with the grip too. So I like this sound. There's just a nice clear tone, but with a flat, with a uh, smooth plastic pick, there's a little brighter sound there, a little more edge to the sound of the pick on there. So I just prefer that. But finger picking, I mean, I can do it, and I play a guitar that way. I don't play as much guitar these days as I used to because of arthritis. But I, I finger pick a lot on guitar. Um, but with dulcimer, what I really liked about the flat pick, and I'm not trying to <laughs> preach the flat picking to you and convert you from finger picking, don't get me wrong, but I always preferred it because I could strum in the tune, but I could also stop and cross pick and emulate finger picking with, with the flat pick still in my hand. So that's just a lot like that uh, piece I was playing a minute ago. I could. matter of managing your fingernails and things like that so I just never did much with finger picking but as far as the uh, uh, the voice the timber the sound of the instrument uh, that's one of those things where the uh, western red cedar and and everything I'm understanding is redwood will have the same kind of qualities 
that's another area where those two kind of top woods would shine is that nice uh, almost uh, almost harp like tones in, that you get with finger picking um, so the instrument doesn't have to be specifically made for finger I and mean, it can be but it doesn't have to be specifically made for one style or the other uh, you can use uh, same instrument for both but certain wood combinations would favor one over the other perhaps maybe <laughs> i'm not absolutely convinced of that but when i get this redwood one done uh that's going to be something i'm really going to lay into and really compare if i can hopefully i'll have a redwood top one and a cedar top one side by side at the same time to do some a b testing on that so i can evaluate it um also to everybody if you go to the chat uh, Hannah put in tindlemusic.com and solidgroundstands.com if you want to grab those quick and copy them to your browser or wherever you want to copy them to. I also put SG stands. It's just shorter to type, but it is the same address. It'll get you the oh, same. okay. SG stands. Oh, I see it. Yes, I see that. So, whichever. Okay. All right. Anything before we go? I do want to thank you for doing this, Mark. And I want to thank Hannah for doing this. <laughs> well, um, and I do appreciate it. This is going to be on YouTube. Um, and I'll also put it on our group. So you'll have that as well. Okay. So, and, uh, oh, somebody thank me, Lisa. <laughs> so, um, if there's nothing else, we're going to, we're going to close. And uh, I do want to thank everybody that's coming. We did get some more people. I didn't see the other ones who came in. Um, so we did get some more. So hello, Bill and Carolyn. I didn't see you all before, I don't think. I'm glad you guys were able to join us. And uh, John wrote, fascinating. Thank you. And beautiful playing, too. By the way, that was, that was really interesting. That was, that was really good. I've enjoyed this. You know, I, I, you get me started. It's kind of hard to, to shut me up. It's like... Uh, my, my kids and I are always quoting movies, but there's one that, that comes to mind. It's like, you know, he's like a uh, jukebox, you know, you put in the quarter, you got to let the whole song play. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know where that's from. Anyway, yeah, just got to let him roll. So sorry if I got long winded, put everybody to sleep, but I've enjoyed it. And uh, we'll, we'll do some, maybe we could do a Dulcimer playing workshop or something in the future or something like that. Okay. Yeah. I'd be for that. So, um, Yes, well, thank you. That was great. And uh, you're, you're getting other, somebody wrote, fascinating, thank you, beautiful playing. Uh, that was a great program, thanks. So 